Welcome in to the best in true crime podcasting. This is True Crime Tuesday. I'm your host, Tim Dennis. Got a good show ahead for today, folks. I read the best fictional book today. I know I'm stuck on the fictional thing lately. Read the best crime fiction book this past weekend, folks. I'm enthralled with this book. I'll tell you, it's called The Serial Killer's Son Takes a Wife. And it's got this amazing premise. Imagine, if you will, you're the son of a serial killer. First of all, life's not going good for you. (laughs) It's not been a good life. But then after your dad gets busted, life just goes weird after that. We'll explain as we get into the show today because There's a bunch of twists and turns and windy roads. And although we can't get into the whole thing because we don't want to spoil the book for you, there's enough that we can get into that it gets weirder after that. The whole thing is weird. It's it's a weird, wonderful little trip that Michael Libling, who is the author of this book, he's got such a wonderful mind, folks. And this book is so good. It's so good. You have to get into this book. And we've got a link in the description of this program to get you there. I want you to really pick up this book and uh, give it a good read. And in fact, read it twice because there's stuff in here that when you read it the first time around, you go, did that really just happen? And you got to go back and reread it. I know I'm going to take a second read of it because it was that good. Michael Libling, our guest today, is a World Fantasy Award finalist whose short fiction has appeared in the Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction, Asimov's Science Fiction, Realms of Fantasy, The Year's Best Fantasy and Horror, The Year's Best Science Fiction and Fantasy, and many others. The Serial Killer's Son Takes a Wife. The book we're talking about today is his second novel. His first is Hollywood North, a novel in six reels, and it was published back in 2019. Creator and former host of the long-running CJAD trivia show in Montreal, Michael is the father of three daughters and lives on Montreal's West Island with his wife, Pat, and a big black dog named Piper. Among other things, he claims to be one of only a handful of North American authors who has never owned a cat. I don't blame him for that. We'll talk about that as well during the program today. You can also find out more about him at Michael Libling, L-I-B-L-I-N-G dot com. We'll post that link as well in the description of this program so you can get to know him better, where he has been known to blog on occasion, or feel free to track him down on his social media sites. We'll post those as well so you can track him down there and get to know him even better. Let's welcome in to True Crime Tuesday, Michael Libling. Hi, Michael. How are you? I'm pretty good. It's uh, somebody once said to me, it's a pressure to be here. <laughs> it's a pressure to be here? A pressure to be here. No, come on. It's just a nice, easy conversation. I know, I know. And I I, I picked up on that right away and listening to uh, Darkness Radio, some of the episodes. It's uh, You certainly make your uh, guests feel at home. Well, I try. I mean, you know, I'm not going to ask you any really bad questions. I mean, there's no medical history you had to fill out or, you know, I didn't ask any deep, dark questions in pre-interview or anything like that. Um, Oh, I'm open. I'm open to almost anything. The worst that can happen is I'll say, I really have to go now, Tim. Thank you very much. (laughs) Well, I'll try not to push you to that point, Mike. I I, I try not to. Um, Although we can get into your history, let's talk a little bit about you before we get to the book. Um, let's, uh, Let's learn a little bit about Michael. Um, first of all, let's dig into you. Uh, uh, not that we need to know about schooling or anything like that, but you didn't grow up in a serial killer's home, did you? No, no. Uh, okay. My parents owned this uh, tiny restaurant in uh, Trenton, Ontario, which when I was growing up, it was about a town of uh, 12,000 people. Oh. Um, about, uh, I guess about 100 miles from Toronto. And uh, no, my they were very loving parents and uh, good parents. Uh, but what I because of the restaurant was in the same building as the movie theater. There was two movie theaters in town, and, and it was next door to one of them. I got into the movies for free. Oh, so I went to Saturday matinees every week, and um, I, I got hooked on like on mainly B movies. But in the nineteen um, fifties and sixties in, in Trent at the movie theater. They would be showing movies from the 30s and 40s, 50s and 60s. So I was just exposed to all these old films in a, in a theatrical environment. And I wanted to be making these things. I, I The more I saw, I wanted to do this. Yeah. And um, I just, what's the easiest way? How do I do it? And I started writing stories at a very early age. Uh, 
probably eight or nine. Um, and, and I'll tell you the pivotal moment for me, in, and it's really um, followed me in anything I've written since. Uh, the teacher, I think it was grade five or six, grade five it was, the teacher gave us an assignment. We had to write a story about a fire. And I went home and I started writing about a fire. And my older sister, Mara, came by and she looked down and she said, you know, everybody's going to write about a, uh, a building on fire or a house on fire. And she said to me, burn something different. And it stuck in my head and I ended up writing about a forest fire instead of a building. And I was the only person in the class to have done this. And uh, the teacher read my story aloud. And it was the first time that it had ever happened to me. And she said, this was the most original story and all of that. And I just love that feeling. And ever since that day, thanks to my older sister, um, I try to burn something different. So if I'm writing a, a, a serial killer novel like this, I didn't want to make it run of the mill where you've got the procedural with the police tracking down the serial killer and, mm -hmm. and all of this. I, I wanted to, I just approached it. Um, I don't want to say from the back door, but from maybe the chimney coming down the yeah. chimney is, is a different approach to the story. Yeah. Well, it, it is a different approach in that, you know, it's, it's a collateral damage approach. It really is. Yeah. It's, it's how do you how do you look at the people who are destroyed from what happens to the person doing the destroying uh, and and how do you look at how that damaged person tries to how they try to pick up the pieces and yet how they look at life in general i mean, I mean in in you know is it nature or nurture you know do they do they have that same dna and yet, how do they look at life through the experiences that they've been through? And 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 then how do they make choices? You know, and, and, and the the things the things that you can spin off and write, Michael, from from all of that are just immense. I mean, the, the material you can come up with from just that one premise of serial killer's son is amazing. Yeah. Um <sighs> I'm just trying to put into uh, to words here what, what, what's been uh, running through my mind as you say that. Um, he, he's very young when it happens, and he thinks he's, he's living a normal life. We all do. And I guess I can relate to that in a way. Um, my parents were wonderful parents, each on their own, but they didn't get along at all. And, and I know I would go to friends' houses and see parents that appeared to be getting along. Mm -hmm. And I, I was sort of envious of that. Why aren't my parents getting along? And I sort of put Bobby, the, the protagonist for the, the serial killer's son takes a wife, into that same sort of space, especially after it's happened. And um, the, the fears he would have along with, you know, it, growing up, I would think, you know, with my wife, am I going to be that kind of parent where, where I'm always at loggerheads with my wife, which was certainly not the case. And with Bobby, the fear would be, um, am I going to uh, am I going to inherit what my father did? Am I going to be a serial killer, too? Is it genetic? And uh, just taking that premise um, and sitting down and thinking about it, you just fly from there. Um, and the way you fly from there as a writer, certainly in my case, I become the character. And once I become the character, I hear the voice in my head. I can write that opening paragraph a hundred times, but maybe it's on the second try, I nail the voice. And as soon as that comes together for me, I live it. I live it from beginning to end. Um, with all the fears of that character, the joys he experiences, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, I mentioned to you before, uh, it, well, the genetic aspect, of course, am I going to become a serial killer? And then I'm living with what my father did. Mm -hmm. How do I tell somebody if I want to fall in love? Can I fall in love? Um, will anybody love me if they find out what my father did? You know, I find that aspect incredibly accurate. You know, from as someone who had parents that didn't get along, I know for, as someone who comes from a family with divorced parents and, and divorced parents in the 80s when, when people just didn't get divorced, you know, especially the early 80s, people just didn't get divorced. You say to yourself, okay, when I make that choice, if I'm going to get into a long-term relationship or get married or whatever it is, 
boy, I'm going to be sure. I got to be yeah. sure because I'm not going to mess it up. You know, no, especially when I, I remember the, the, you know, lying in bed at night, hearing my parents, ar- they stayed together, by the way, but hearing my parents argue and just shaking like a leaf in bed being five or six, but they were wonderful people. I know this is nuts, yeah, but yeah. On a, they were, they were great people, loving parents, not physical in any way, yep. but just that shouting, you know, and uh, yeah. so you, I, you, I guess the thing, so you, you know, just, with Bobby. You, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go, but Bobby. You, no, no. I was just going to say with Bobby, although his parents are not exactly the most wonderful of people, they both have their, uh, they're both treats in their own uh, distinct ways. That's for sure. And there's something about um, the relationship of, of Bobby and, and his Bobby's father and mother. And we'll talk about them here in a moment um, that there's love, but there isn't. You know, there's, yeah. uh, you know, there's caring, there's, there's love, but there isn't. And we'll, like I said, we'll talk about that in a moment, but they, they, he doesn't get a real look at what a functional relationship is. It is very much dysfunction. And so no, and he's, he, oh, no, okay. he's, he's afraid. He's very much afraid mm-hmm. from what he, what he has witnessed. And he doesn't know what, what parental love, well, it, you know, uh, two parents who might love each other what that relationship really might be because um they're they're very different these parents and maybe not so different from people who've gone through uh similar situations and i don't mean serial killing or what bobby's mother does as a hobby <laughs> or as an application mm-hmm. but um it doesn't take much for, for kids to be traumatized in certain ways so let me ask you you can say yourself let me ask you this then michael so so as an author it's not hard for you to crawl into this character's head and write this, this book. But when it comes to maybe crawling into other characters' heads and going past your scope of knowledge, is it hard for you to like, say, get into a romantic scope or a scope where you have to jump leaps and bounds to a different uh, a different feeling that maybe you haven't, I, I don't want to say you haven't felt, but that you could imagine. Is it, is it tough for you or is it easy for you? Yeah, I don't really find it, it all that tough. I mean, I've got, my wife and I have been together a long time. Um, I, I, she's not Corey, <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. But um, there's a lot of very special things about her, uh, her sense of humor, uh, her warmth, her, her love. And, and you, so I can take this and apply it to another character who might be totally different and make these aspects of my own wife aspects of, of this character. Uh, so it's really not hard to do it, for really anything I've written. And, and I don't always write in, in the first person, but I, I often do because I, I kind of just lets you do so much. Um, but mo- I, I, I get very close to my characters because I'm living with them. Mm-hmm. And when a story is finished, it can be a short story or a novel. I mourn the characters because I've got, I've gotten to know them so well, their quirks, even the villains, the bad guys, um, you know, the minor characters, I do mourn them. And I think about them after the book is done. It, it's one of the reasons I, when I finish a story or a novel, I have a heck of a time starting a new one because I'm still living uh, sort of in the past, as you might say. And I'm not sure if I've answered your question. No, you have, you have. That's very interesting. I, and I, and I get that because you, I can see where when you, when you live with a character for as long as you do, you almost want to continue their story. I mean, you've left them at a certain point and you think, you know what? I think there's more meat on the bone. I think we can keep going here. We were talking before the show I can see where you can continue the story after reading this book. I can see where there might be more to this, where you could add to the legend, so to speak, or you could go back in time and you could tell a prequel to this story. And you had a great title. You had a great title for a possible sequel. <laughs> you know, I don't know if it'll throw people off, but you know, give your title, say what you thought it could be. Well, okay. So the, the, the name of the, the, the 
serial killer in the book, Bobby, uh, that Bobby's name is Bobby Blessing in the in the book because his mom changed their name. But their last name before it was changed was Dickens. Right? Yeah. So I thought it would be funny because Bobby's mom was involved in the Christmas industry, right? And and yep. Christmas was their favorite time of year. I thought it would be funny if you named it a Dickens Christmas. I thought it would be funny too. Yeah. A little deceptive, but it is. funny. Yeah. And, I, and I, yeah. I, I like it so much. I, I've jotted it down here. And just to keep in mind how you put the twist on that, just so you don't outright lie to readers. Um, but, you know, you well, there's you a, were talking about... I, I should mention to them too, there's a subtitle because you put brilliantly in the book, and I don't think we're spoiling anything by telling people this, no. when, when Bobby's father, the serial killer in our book, it's Henry Taylor Dickens, right? Is that his right? It, right. Henry, yes, it. Henry Taylor Dickens, when as he would cover things up, because he would he would come home sometimes, and he would he would bring home a little remnant of his his escapades. Sometimes he would have blood on him, in order to keep from tracking it anywhere or getting it anywhere on the house. As he was coming in, he would paint the porch red, so that just in case there was a little on his shoe it wouldn't get on the porch. See, you cover it up red on red. So the porch wasn't green, it wasn't blue, it wasn't gray. It was red. And there's a brilliant reason for that. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Okay. Uh, you know, those footsteps. And, and also at the same time, which, which you know, in the back of my head is that they, they won the most patriotic house in town award because the porch was red. So in addition, he painted some blue on the house and some white. So it was red, white, and blue. But the whole reason behind it that started that, of course, was the porch and tracking home evidence of, of what he might have done. There you go. Um, so so the yeah. subtitle of this book is A Dickens Christmas, The Porch Was Painted Red. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I yeah. really loved it. I, I like that whole idea. There As I said, should I ever do that, you will get into the acknowledgments. Um, but, you know, you, you mentioned a sequel, and a, and a lot of people have been asking me for sequels. And, I, and I've got a lot of ideas for them, and I've jotted a lot of notes down, and I've got different approaches that I might take. Um, I've always been very wary of it in terms of even short fiction. And my previous novel, too, um, somebody had wanted me to do an extension of it in, 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 in Montreal, actually. I live in Montreal, mm -hmm. and, and it takes place in the small town of Trenton, Ontario, where I grew up in, which has an incredibly bizarre history. But I, I, I was the reason I'd never done a sequel to anything, I was at the World Fantasy Conference a few years ago, and I was speaking to an author, and I won't mention his name, a, a really wonderful man, and he had just come out with the 10th novel in this series. And I said to him, um, don't you get bored with the characters and, and all this after so many books in the series? Yeah. And he looks around to make sure no one's around, no readers are around here or anything. He looks right, looks left. And then he sighs and he says to me, oh, Michael, oh, God, yes. You have no idea how bored I am writing these, but the readers demand it. And, he, and his books are terrific. Yeah. You would never know he's bored with it. He doesn't want to do it. But he gets the paycheck and the readers keep buying the series. I just didn't ever want to be in that situation. But I think with the serial killer's son takes a wife, I th as, as you said, I think there's enough material there for prequel and sequel. I don't think I'd go 10 with it. No, <laughs> no, no. I could see going probably, you know, two more in, in with it we'll, ju we'll just see what happens well the you know, my brain is always thinking first thing in the morning last thing at night ideas popping into my head jotting notes down speaking to the dog and looking at my wife and says what are you thinking about and i lie to her because she never knows she never has a clue what i'm writing until i'm done not a clue i think the prequel you've pretty much written i mean there's throughout the book you you mention what henry has done as far as, I mean, you, you've kind of given us little splashes of what he's not, yeah. not being facetious here, but little splashes of what he's done um, in his, in his career and given us little previews of how he's done it. So, you know, as far as the victims and how he's killed them, when he's killed them and in an interesting way, his son 
in order to center himself, will has all of his father's crimes memorized. So yeah. he will recite them, the, the names, how they were killed, and in what order. It, it, t- tell us a little bit on, on how you came up with that and, and why he does that. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's his past it, it weighs upon him to such an extent. It, it's he feels a guilt, I think, for what his father father did, and he over time he becomes very aware of every single victim and every, every murder weapon that was used. Because um, because the problem with with the father is he doesn't really have a pattern, which makes it more difficult for him, him to be caught. So uh, this this came to me actually one night in bed. I'm lying there and I I have a heck of a time falling asleep. I'm not a great sleeper, mm-hmm. and. I, I sometimes count back from a hundred and or in the past, I, as a kid, I would count sheep. And I said, well, what would Bobby be counting? And I said to myself, he, he starts counting his father's victims. This is how he falls asleep. He goes backwards with it. And somehow I, I don't see how that would ease him into sleep, but as Bobby, I did see it. And he, he keeps repeating and repeating and repeating until finally he's just gone and he's sleeping. And that that's how it really came about also reminded me years ago i took transcendental medication med- medication it's not like the medication at times meditation yeah and um, you'd be sitting there and you'd repeat your mantra over and over in your brain and when other thoughts would creep in you, you'd keep going back to the mantra and in a way i thought this would be similar for bobby that if you repeat it often enough these these crimes the victims they almost become nonsense words. If you repeat something over and over, they, they tend to ha- lack meaning over time. Mm-hmm. And I think this is part of it, too, the process for Bobby to alleviate his guilt, that he shouldn't have it all. He should not have guilt, but he does. Well, in that way, too, he can dehumanize it and he can try to move past it. Um, and exactly. In, and in that way, he can, even though he doesn't say it uh, so much, and it's not inferred in the book at all. To me, in my meaning, when I read the book, I think to myself, you know what? He can start to get to the point where he can deal with his father in his head. He's seen a lot. He's yeah. he's dealing with a lot as far as his father. In order to think that this isn't some sort of inhuman monster and start to look at him as his father, he has to put a lot to the side. He's got to put a lot away in order to think of this as even a human being or a man, not much less his father. Well, of course, you know, he, he loved his father right up until the second he became very afraid of his father. And we learn about that later on in the novel. Um, but, but even then, when, when we do learn about that, he was still carrying on with his normal life with his dad until the day his father was caught. Um, and we, and we, we have that scene as well. And, what you know the question throughout the book is how much did bobby know did he did he ever witness anything or know anything again i don't want to give away too much right right um but there are two different things so i i should probably stop here but again when he the day his father is caught that's when he realizes just what kind of person his father was and do you turn off loving your dad at that moment which is something he struggled with he he loves his dad And in the beginning, he struggles with the way the press portrayed him because he knew him as a loving father until he finally realizes, well, perhaps he might have been a loving father, but he's a very, very bad man. Right. Let's do this, Michael. Let's take our break right here. When we come back, let's get to know Bobby a little bit. Let's get to let's get to know his parents just a little And we'll talk about Corey, the woman who walks into his life as he's got this business going, which is kind of an unusual business. We're going to talk about ice cream when we come back and how ice cream came into this whole deal, Michael. I got to know how this happened. Um, It's such an interesting book, folks. And I'm telling you, you got to get a copy of it right now. We've got it in the in the uh, description of this program. We've got a link to it. And I'll tell you. I'm not saying this book's going to change your life, but it's going to change the way you think about the victims and the people surrounding crimes. 
because it really is that that type of book and and what collateral damage means to you when when we talk about um these type of these type of crimes serial killers because you never think about who's involved in the whole mix you know you always think of the serial killer and you think of people glorifying serial killers you never think of the people next to them when you read this yeah. book you'll think of the whole thing in a, a, a an entirely different way and there are believe it or not folks there is humor in this book and it's it's quite the, the humor in the book is actually quite ironic and quite funny as well uh the serial killer's son takes a wife is the name of the book when we come back more with michael libling we'll talk about bobby and we'll talk about his family and we'll talk ice cream when we come back. One of my favorite subjects when we come back right here on the best in true crime podcasting. This is true crime Tuesday. Welcome back to the best in true crime podcasting. This is true crime Tuesday. I'm your host, Tim Dennis. Our guest is Michael Libling. The book is the serial killer's son takes a wife. It's available right now. And we have a link in the description of this program. So you can get a copy of that book. I'm telling you folks, I absolutely love this book. And I'll tell you, Everything from the premise, just the premise of following around someone who's, I mean, the collateral damage is right there from the time they're young to the present day, just their life being screwed up turn after turn after turn after turn. That's the only thing I can give you from this, this book. And the twists and turns in this book are amazing. The humor in it as well, Michael. Amazing. I mean, it, it's the the ironic humor in this is, and, and I love ironic humor. is is something to behold. Now, your your words are really kind, Tim. And I, I think what I should do is to take you everywhere I go with me, just have you stand <laughs> beside. Me. I think that would be a real benefit. Well, I, I I'd be glad. It doesn't it doesn't hurt the ego either. Well, that well, I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the serial killer's son takes a wife is, is amazing. It's, it's available now from Wordfire Press. Um, folks, I got to tell you, Bobby Blessing, as he's first known when we first meet him, is, uh, is a, a rich character in that he, boy, you want to talk about a guy who refuses to be a victim. He, um, when we first meet him, he's, he started his own business michael and he started it around ice cream tell me how how and why you decided to put him in the ice cream business well again i wanted to get something that in my mind was as far removed as his dark past as possible and you know the ice cream is a happy thing generally mm -hmm. speaking and and that really that was all it came down to uh you know i mentioned my parents had this uh, small restaurant and I'm talking small, had nine seats to the counter at four tables, and they sold ice cream. And I remember scooping cones and things like this. And I guess it was all connected in that way. It was just, it, when I meet somebody who doesn't like ice cream, mm -hmm. it's always a shock to me. And there's very few people who are like that. So that was really it. I just wanted something innocuous that he could bury himself in and leave his dark past behind and, and have a happy environment. Well, Bobby's a, Bobby's a wizard at it. I mean, he comes up with some great wow. flavors. He's he's into it. He he loves his work, which is great. I mean, well, that, you know, he 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 goes to I think it's the University of uh, Pittsburgh or Pennsylvania. I can't remember the moment. Because years ago, my wife and I were looking at perhaps getting into the ice cream business, and and the university there has something called the ice cream short course. So I have him go to the school and learn ice cream after he, he had a job in, in the in the industry in Syracuse and then he opens up an ice cream parlor in Saratoga Springs New York and um, I know that area fairly well I have a, a, a daughter one of my daughters lives there with her family um, so the idea of a tourist area which again you've got ice cream you've got a tourist area it's just joy people are coming to let loose to have a good time but at the same time, having grown up in a small town, like again, Trenton, Ontario, you always have the feeling if you spend any time in a, in a small town, you know, you know, there's evil lurking below the surface. Yeah. And Trenton was certainly that case. And when you're in a tourist town and you see a police car, it, even a police car seems out of, out of, out of whack in a, in a tourist town. But you know things are going on that are very dark. And that's another reason I wanted the ice cream business, such a happy thing in a tourist town. 
yet there's something simmering. And you know as you're reading this, it's going to explode at a certain point in time. It, it can't remain this way as much as Bobby wants it to be. Very much so, very much so. Let's talk, before we talk a little bit about his future, let's talk a little bit about his past and, and talk just a brief bit about his, his mother and father. You introduce us to his mother and father via flashback. And we, we get just a little glimpse into, in the beginning of the book, his, his mother and his father, his, his father was involved in the sweets business as well. What did his father do? He, he was a candy salesman, which was another idea of a cover for a, um, a serial killer. But again, it goes back to my roots in my parents' little store there. You know, they had, you know, penny candy in these little troughs, you know, and, and kids would go in and, and you'd buy there. So, again, it's this idea of, you know, the word that is so rarely used nowadays, a career in confections. Mm -hmm. So ice and candy was a confection. And going to the ice cream business. And in the back of my mind, it would, it would dawn on Bobby that I, I've entered the same kind of career, really, when you get down to it as my father, which puts on more pressure. Well, can a career in confections be genetic? And if a career in confections is genetic, can a career as a serial killer be genetic? It's funny, and I'm not spoiling anything, but there's parallels that you manage to run throughout the book again nature versus nurture it, it 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 really does run through the book and there's times where bobby has to stop and think he has to go well is this really me or is this just part of me you know is, is this you know is this me controlling what i'm doing or is this just ingrained you know, is this I mean, you you are you are an incredibly perceptive reader to, to pick up on all of this. And, you know, you, you, you said you read it basically over two days, over yeah, the weekend, two days. Yep. And, you know, and, and it's exciting for me to hear you say this. You know, people will tell me things and, you know, it, it, but you really you have a handle on this. I should be interviewing you about <laughs> the book because, I mean, it, it's it's really interesting what you did pick up on, which I wanted people to pick up on, mm -hmm. but not everyone does. And, and that's really impressive. Well, he he really kind of jumps off the page. He, he's he's a he's very I, I find him fascinating. He's a fascinating character in that, you know, he he he's not the mo most serial killers are the narcissistic type and you find Henry is that narcissist. He's very much that narcissist, but Bobby's not Bobby's been beaten up by life. And well, his mother, you know, his mother is a narcissist as yes. well and he's caught between the two. Yes. Yeah. So he is the, the, you've got rock hard plays and Bobby, you know, boom, boom, yeah. and boom. But he hasn't been given the opportunity as of yet to really stretch out and see if he's a narcissist because he's spent so much time putting the controls on himself to not want to be that narcissist, to not give himself the ego that he doesn't know. He doesn't know. He's, a, he's living with the fear. So when this woman enters his life, and I mean, he's had relationships, but very short lived relationships prior to this, because as soon as he tells a woman, he, he feels the need to be upfront about this. I mean, you're sitting there with a woman you're interested in. Oh, by the way, my dad's a serial killer. I mean, I don't know too many women who will who would want to sit there after that, no matter how nice she might find it. Mm -hmm. there, there will be that. So he, he's afraid. How do you tell the woman you love your dad is a serial killer? And then when you go to meet the parents and there's a scene in that, um, and, you know, the father of, 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 the, of the woman you love might, might say, oh, so so what does your father do for a living? <laughs> you know? Right. And that was, oh, and what does your mother do? You know, these are questions he doesn't want to answer. And it, it's, again, it's what it first is the relationship with a woman. And then it, where will that, if he gets in a serious relationship, where will that lead? So when he meets Corey and she's very interested in him, it's obvious from the get-go that she's interested in him. And he's very afraid of it because he, he fears he will lose her. And and what happens? How does they confront that? Um, and in most cases, I think he tells 
the, the women he likes, that his father is a serial killer because he wants the relationship to end because he's afraid we, we might go after that for himself and for the woman. Now, mom's got an interesting job in that she's got a studio behind the house. It's like a little little carriage house or whatever you want to call it that's behind the house. And she's into Christmas themes. Yes. Christmas themed yes. photography is a, is a good way of putting it, correct? Well, she has a Christmas catalog. This is, um, she evolves eventually to the internet, but she's taking photos um, of the items she buys. And she has some very specialized Christmas decorations, or ornaments and the like. Um, so she set up a studio to take these photos. That's what she leads people to believe at least. Okay. Um, I don't want to give away too much sure. about the mother other than that, sure. but, but you know, the, the Christmas ornaments eventually take her and that studio in the back, take her in a, a, another direction, mm -hmm. which again, my intent here, these two narcissists he's living with called parents was just to pile on it. How much can he take? And as the novel goes along, starting with the parents, it's just piling on more and more and more. And how is he going to survive this? Yeah. You know, and, and with his psyche intact. Right. And you mentioned, uh, OK, so he's been pushing away, pushing away, pushing away, pushing away and and trying to maintain, for lack of a better term, maintain his sanity. And as he's working his own business, loony scoops, right? That's right, Looney Scoops. Yes. Right, uh, which he, which I find ironic as well. Looney Scoops. Um, and creating these wonderful flavors and trying to push off the, even the push off the advances of different women, including a reporter who wants to write this great story on him. Um, he, he gets the gasoline thrown on the proverbial fire with this wonderfully amazing woman who walks in and starts flirting with him. And of all things, she's a dentist. Now you want to talk about, <laughs> you want to talk about parallels here. I mean, you know, ice cream and dentists. Come on, Michael. I mean, one of those things where Bobby's got to roll his eyes and go, come on, ice cream and dentists, you know, oil and water. I mean, so where does that come from out of your imagination? Well, uh, one of my best friends is a dentist here in Montreal. I, I met him actually at Expo 67. We were both pedicab drivers together, which was a bicycle with two seats in the front, and, we, and we'd give these tours. And he, we just remained friends ever since. So I've learned a lot about dentistry from him, and his son is a dentist as, as well. And um, so when I was looking at professions for her, and uh, she's very bright, as we know. Um, I thought it would be a, a nice juxtaposition, as you mentioned, the father being in the candy business, which runs counter as well, and then Bobby in the ice cream business. You know, um, the sweetness of it all, the sugar of it all. And then at the same time, which runs counter to dentistry, but it's the, um, I guess, the sugar, uh, you know, uh, sweet and sour in effect. Mm -hmm. next to each other um I, i'm leaving i, I want to say something else here and i'm not sure what i want to say exactly how to express it okay but it, it, it these things came about very na naturally okay that it just made sense to me as i made her a dentist and i had her as another career i think she might have been uh was an insurance salesman originally something like that life insurance and then I said, no, no, no. I want to be more professional, somebody very well educated and running counter to the, to the sweets again. Mm -hmm. I, I know it was a brilliant stroke. I know that much. Um, and it's, it's everything that would be supportive to, if you want to look at it this way, again, a little bit of psychoanalysis here, Michael. If you look at it this way, his father was in a destructive business and into destruction. He technically is in a destructive business. If you look at sugar as destructive to the body, okay? Here she is building up. Here she is building him up. You know, she comes into his life and is complimentary, is flirtatious, 
is telling him, you know, all these great things and keeps dropping hints that, hey, you know what? I'm kind of into you, you know, and, and he keeps telling himself, I don't know, eventually I got to drop this on her. I got to tell her that, you know, my dad's a serial killer. I got to push her away, but I don't want to. Maybe this one's different. You know, you know, you. I think answered your own question better than I answered the question. You, you, again, you, you really have nailed it. I just want you to interview yourself from this point on. <laughs> no, no, I think no, that no, will do a, no. a wonderful job. But, but the, 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 the thing is, is the, the, for all intents and purposes, it, it seems like there's a balance here with her. But, but is it a balance that's healthy? Yes. Well, we've always got to leave the door open for her and every other character in in this novel. Um, You know, is is everything what it seems? You know, um, you know, that's what Bobby, I think, at a certain point forgets and fails in some ways to protect himself from certain individuals by taking things at face value which he should know not to, even including running the the ice cream business and and what happens with that business over time, thinking he's safe and secure, living far away from the scene of the crime, a different name, nobody knows who he is, and, and, and all of that. But at the same time, nothing good lasts forever, and he knows this. From yeah. his, you know, being a child with these two parents to this business, and now the woman who he loves and apparently loves him. Yeah. There's some other themes in there, too. I mean... We can only drop so many hints. Yeah. And Henry Taylor Dickens is technically in jail for his crimes. Yeah. And I think we can drop this much of a hint that Bobby does not visit, does not associate with his father. There's no relationship there, nor does he want right. one, nor does he want to associate with his father. How much more do you want to reveal about this what's safe here michael that we can reveal to our listeners about this book because i don't i feel like i can't push too much further without unraveling some stuff here no and i sincerely appreciate that i I, you know i've seen some reviews just one review was just spoilers throughout and it it drove me crazy but you you can't say anything Mm -hmm. um there will there will come bobby has avoided his father really since he was 11 years old when he, when he sees his father, I will say he sees his father being arrested. Um, there is a bombshell along the way. You know, there are twists and turns as, as you've expressed and Bobby's done everything he can to avoid his father until he reaches a point where he no longer can. And I don't know if I can say more beyond that or want to, but if you have ideas or suggestions, because right now I feel you're my co-author, how well you dissect <laughs> this novel, please express it. I'm not afraid that you're really going to give up any terrible spoilers. I think I think you've given some interesting hints and open open doors for me, you know. Here, is it safe to say that he's managed to stay away from his hometown for a certain amount of time until there's an incident until he's drawn back? Until circumstances, he, he has to go home, you know? Yeah. And um, it might not be a, an entirely valid reason that he, he decides to go back. It's not necessarily the scene of the crime, but it's certainly the, the scene of his life where his life was derailed, where Bobby's life was derailed. And again, um, it's this piling on and this building up. Here's a happy guy running an ice cream parlor apparently carrying this tremendous guilt a wonderful woman comes into his life certain things happen that keep piling up he thinks he's safe but he realizes he's not all that safe yeah and you know people you know people will blame him for the sins of his father and he's experienced that he's experienced it as a kid living in this town Uh, you know he was shunned as soon as it was revealed what his father did this small town isn't going to embrace this family. They are going to hate this family, and they're going to suspect this family as being participants in the crime, knowing more than they might say they know. But again, the piling on, the piling on, it reaches a certain point where he's forced to return to this town. And I don't think it's a great, a, a terrible spoiler to confront his demons, 
or so he thinks he's confronting his demons. Right, right. The other thing that I think we can mention too is is when Bobby was very young, after his father was arrested, his mother decides to beat feet and get out of town. And, yeah. and exactly to do that, to escape the sins of the father. And she, she leaves. And when she leaves, she makes no qualms about the fact that she can't deal with Bobby and lets Bobby go to school in a different spot. Um, she sends him off to boarding school. Yeah. She abandons him. She, you know, again, it's, she, she's a, a narcissist. Um, and she'd already had the sideline, which readers will invent. She sells Christmas ornaments, which is the upfront business. And then she has a sideline that was already well established by then. She started this fairly early on. And a lot of her sideline uh, takes place in Europe, where she perhaps sometimes goes to source Christmas items and then partakes of this other career. But yeah, she's... She's she's a cold fish to put it mildly. Yeah. And um she Bobby is a burden to her, and I, I think she expresses that. Um and, and does, as you said, just a, abandons him to a boarding school. Um you know, you know, will I see you at Christmas? You know, will I will I visit you? And um, oh you'll find something to do. And well, well, where will you be? Oh, you'll you'll find out in time, basically. Um so and again, I've, I've known parents like that, believe it or not. Not mine, but I know people who have had parents um, like that. And it, it's an investigation. Um, again, nothing is what it seems. What's really lurking behind the surface? Um, there are people you trust, but will you be able to trust these people forever? Things yeah. change over time. People reveal themselves. And I wanted to get this across in the book. Um, this idea of truth, um, how... You and I can be, you know, watching a crime take place, so we're going to have two different versions of what we saw. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to express this as well from a lot of characters within. Um, some people see serial killers as, well, most, I would hope, I hope almost everybody is, as, as you know, a ho horrible, horrible thing, horrible people. Yeah. And others will build them up. I mean, Manson had a following mm -hmm. to be, again, these icons. Um, and I really cannot stand it i cannot stand when these people are immortalized and turned into heroes jesse james a hero a cow i i love westerns i love westerns and jesse james you know oh man and one of my all-time favorite movies is the old jesse james movies there were two of them with henry fonda and uh cornell wilde i think it was, was mm -hmm. cornell wilde one of them. Mm -hmm. i'm not mm -hmm. sure which yep. but um they um they if you read the true story behind him, you know how he was not a good person. He was a racist and all of this. But the legend is fun. The legend is fun. And I don't like when these same killers, that they become legends in certain people's minds for no good reason whatsoever. Yeah. And, and I think I wanted to address that as well. And I think I do in the book. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. If you, if you love these serial killers, then you're a little nuts yourself. Um, you know, the, the first... Um, it was a mass murderer that, rather than a serial killer that, that I, I mentioned this in my previous novel, Hollywood North, that, that took up space in my mind. I was working again in Trenton in the summer of 66 at a marina there. And when the news broke of Richard Speck, I don't know if you remember Richard Speck, yep. Yep. but he killed eight nurses in Chicago. And I remember with the people I was worried, just it like just overwhelmed you and, and it was frightening. You weren't there, but it was horrific to read about it and then i guess uh, that was 66 and three years later i re remember being at my wife's house she was a girlfriend at the time and it was the weekend where the manson killings came out and you you just felt the dread descending upon you i'm, I'm over three thousand miles away from the scene of the crime but the dread descended on me and these are things i never forgot and when I write about these people, I, I want to convey that same sense of dread and horror. I want it to be entertaining, mm -hmm. but I want there sort of to be, I, I don't write with a message in mind. I really don't. Yeah. But a message, as you're writing, the message evolves. And what are you really saying here? You're not talking about killing for killing's sake. I'm not making this man a hero. I, I want to say something about these people who become idols at the same time and who their followers might be. You know, something interesting, though, if I can throw this in, Michael, is is as we get to know Henry throughout the book, 
you take us on an interesting journey with them. Um, I, I mean, if I can be candid, at least in my eyes, and this is only in my eyes. No, please be candid. When, when I first, when I first start following him, it's, there's not much sympathy for him, but there's, it's kind of a, kind of a, oh, you know, kind of when, when, when you first, cause you're thinking, well, maybe this is just a family guy who's gone a little astray. Like, you know, like his wiring's crossed, you know, and then you realize, and again, without any spoilers, then you realize that he truly is not just a guy whose wiring's a little crossed. He's all the way over the edge. I, and, and there is a twist at the end, which I, I cannot possibly address here. Sure. But there, there's, there's definitely a reason for it. Um, it's all a part, it's about delusion. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, I, certainly not the first time where the serial killer has delusions of why he's doing something. You know, the devil made me do it, this kind of thing. Um, I don't want people to have sympathy for him, but I do want people, especially um, people who are interested perhaps in the supernatural or something or whatever, to, to say, well, well, could that be, could that be true? To have some doubts about him. That's, that's, um, that's what I, I didn't get across. Maybe I, I did have some doubts as to maybe he was somewhat righteous for a moment. But I, when you have doubts about it, um, and, and there's a there's a lot behind it. And it's it's tough for me to talk about it unless it, with people who, right. who haven't read the book. So I want to right. be very careful. Mm -hmm. um, th these people who who look beyond and take any, who, who will take a killer at, at at his word as to why he's doing what he's doing. Oh yeah, that that makes sense. Um, I wanted to raise those doubts with the reader with you, let's say, and even though there might be an explanation, oh, maybe he was doing good after all, well, I still want to leave that door open that you're, you, there's no good in what you're doing. There's no reason to be judge, jury, and executioner, no matter what the case is. And if you if you hear a voice in your head, perhaps somebody talking to you, is God telling me to do this? Is the devil making me do this? It's baloney. No matter the bottom line is, yeah. it's baloney. Yeah. You committed a vicious. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. You, you're right. Yeah. No, completely. Um, I hope I'm right because I'm not sure what I'm saying here. Sometimes I'm no, trying to cover no. my. No, you're, you're dead on. You're dead on. That's yeah. the thing. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I think that's the trap when it comes to people who idolize or, or put serial killers on a pedestal they say you know what i think i can kind of see where he's coming from and and yeah you know and and they start to build him up they start to say oh no 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 that they're but don't you see why no no i don't um because you forget the humanity of it all and the fact that this person tore down a human being and did it in and, the name of some crazy you know some oh, crazy yeah. and i wanted bobby to be the defense of saying, no, he's a bad man. Well, look, he did this. No, he's a bad man. And repeatedly, I think he tries to get this across. Um, and I, I, again, I'll leave it at that. Sure. But, he, yeah. but he's always, yeah. he's always, he's fighting his, his father's delusions. Yeah. Continually. Yeah. And in, again, in the book, Bobby is always the fulcrum of sanity, wherever he's going. He's the, he's the one who's trying to be the moral center in in the entire book and that's that's what that's the the focus of trying to ease out it seems like he's the one who's always trying to keep everyone on track and say hey wait a minute you know let's come back yeah. to reality here and i was going to say you know and in, in, in any I, again i can't tell you what happened i don't want to say sure. what happens sure. um, but what i really hate in, in movies or books is when you've got a villain and right at the end the villain gives this long-winded explanation of everything. It just goes on forever. Mm -hmm. And I want, so if you take that, I, I like when the hero, and it rarely happens, debunks this. Oh, it's another long-winded explanation. Says it says exactly what it is. Yeah. It's baloney, right. inevitably baloney, because the core intent is inevitably evil. Right. You're right. Yeah. You're right. 
Well, I tell you, Michael, you've, uh, in my eyes, you've created a masterpiece, man. I, I love this book from beginning to end. The, it's, you know, in most, in most stories, you've got just a few little twists and turns and it's enough to whet the appetite and get you, get you going. And you go, you know what? I could see where, I could see where it was going. I couldn't see where it was going. I, yeah, no, I, I get that a lot. I, I just you, you sit down and it's a it's a roller coaster ride from beginning to end and you go, wow, and and at, you know you get to the end and you go you know what, I'd like to know more. I, I'd like to know where these characters came from and where these characters are going and and you you kind of like well, to see more of the universe. Well, if that happens, I promise you'll be among the very first to know if, if I take it any farther. We'll just have to see. As I said, I've got. I've even got paragraphs written here and opening lines. And, and once I nail an opening line, I fly from there. And I, I've got a couple of concepts I just love. And I'm not even ruling out your title. Of <laughs> Christmas. You that know, would, why the porches were painted red. There you, you go. Know, that that would be uh, amazing. Yeah. That would be amazing. You, 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 can, you know, I, it, despite everything, again, my first objective is to entertain. I do not want to bore the reader. Sure. I want to keep them. I, I don't want to be at... I don't want to do a hack job. I want it to be well-written. Mm -hmm. I want it to be fun to read and surprising, but it, it has to be entertaining. And I, what's, I don't see the point otherwise. Right. Well, this was a lot of fun and it was very entertaining folks. I want you to go out to uh, click the link in this description of this program, go get the serial killer's son takes a wife. I'll guarantee you this is this is a, a thriller from beginning to end. You're going to love this book. It, uh, I had a lot of fun with it, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, Michael. I appreciate you. Tim, I felt like I was talking to myself how well-versed you were on the novel. I thank you very, very much. I said at the outset, it's a real pressure. Now, this was a pleasure throughout. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you, Michael. Um, the Serial Killer's Son Takes a Wife. Go get it right now. And uh, let me know how you liked it. Email me, Tim at darknessradio.com, and, and uh, let's talk about it, because uh, I'd like to know what you guys think. I, I think you're really going to enjoy it. Folks, let's, uh, we don't have to lighten anything up. We, we had a good time talking, so let's just uh, go right to Beer City Bruiser, and let's talk dumb crimes and stupid criminals. It's, it's Crayon News Story Time. What happened with this dude, Christ Bearer? I heard he uh, cut his penis off and then jumped off a balcony. Suspect pulls gun from butt, shoots twice at Denver police. What is your emergency? I need help. And what's the problem? I was too high. You're too high? Yeah. And it's that time you've all been looking forward to, that time once again where we dive into dumb crimes and stupid criminals and to do so we need a co-host we bring in the co-host with the most the bcb the big cuddly bear himself beer city bruiser bruiser how you doing oh flustered, flustered. <laughs> like i said i got a wedding to go to and i forgot about it and mrs bruiser told me about it the other day when i was messaging you about recording times and i'm ah. just like oh that's right we have that so oh but it's my day is filled of of making me look presentable it's <laughs> at oh, a wedding but it's for a good friend so there you go it's for an amazing friend and yeah. family actually and i'm very excited because i'll get to see all my ring of honor brethren and sisters and there you go i'm very excited for the wedding i just forgot about it i had so much stuff going on yeah. with, with this and with the the return to the ring and and all that and it's just like but, whew. but see we can we can move stuff around we can get this done it's not a big deal oh yeah no yeah. we did yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. it's so, just, it's just you know how it is when you forget and you're behind the eight ball and you're like oh yeah. i got so much to do and not enough time <laughs> yeah and just so people know uh tomorrow's supernatural news program we're recording a little early so, yes, so that because we can, I have the wedding. Well, not only that, but I've got some neck surgery I'm doing. A, a minor. That's right. Mi a minor surgical procedure. I just shots in the neck. So we're we're kind of we're condensing this week a little bit. Yes. Uh, Jeff, that way you have time to heal, and yep, Jeff, I have time to that's, panic. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So we can get everything out of the way. Jeff Belanger's with us. So we got a full week this week. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. A little bit of a surprise for you on Supernatural News Wednesday as well. We've got the guys from uh, Mystery of Blind Frog on. Oh, nice. Yeah, so we'll be doing a little bit of a um, little bit of an interview with them as well tomorrow. So 
So there Which you go. I encourage fans to check out that show. If you like uh, Skinwalker, you'll yes. love Blind Frog. It, they take a different approach, but it's pretty much trying to find the same thing, yes. which is amazing. Yep. So going to be a full week, full week yeah. this week on the show. So uh, let's jump into it right away, shall we, shall we Bruiser? Um, yes, please. Let's see some idiots. Well, this one's weird. Okay, so we just came off Veterans Day, which, by the way, thank you to your son. Thank you to, to all the veterans who have served. Um, okay, so the one thing I can't stand, having uh, veterans in, in my family as well, um, are people who disrespect, blatantly disrespect. I agree. And, and so uh, I was kind of silent on Veterans Day. I don't know why. I, I'm normally not, but I, it was, uh, I don't know, it was it was a uh, little bit of a rough day for me. I don't know why, but it was. Uh, I, I did it in private. I called my son and yeah, and I did. So this is this is your first of many. And yeah. You've earned it, and and you did something a lot of people aren't brave enough to do, and that's that's serve your country. Yeah, you yeah. know, especially and he served in a time where we didn't know if we were going to go to war. We didn't know if we were just chilling out. He got in right around the time when all the protests. His first deployment was when he was on base. They said, you have to sit on this 50 caliber gun. And if any of the, this is when they were protesting up in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And his orders were, if any civilians step across that line, you have to shoot him with this 50 caliber gun. Oh, jeez. None of them did. Thank goodness. You yeah. know, but he, yeah. he, you know, I kind of messed with him. I because bet. yeah, I bet. he's not being told why. He's just told this is your orders. Yikes. You know? Yeah. And so that's why I thank every veteran out there because you you did something a lot of us don't have the courage to do. Uh, it, 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 um, yeah, that, that, that had to have messed with him big time. I, yeah, yeah, I can't imagine. I mean, it's one yeah. thing to put yourself in a different mindset and go across the seas and, and do what you have to do, but uh, to sit at home and have to do what you have to do is a whole different thing, that's for sure. Especially when you're in that bubble, because he didn't know why these people were protesting. He was, he's was he been in a basic training for so long, away from media, away from everything. Yeah. yeah. And now here's civilians who he's sworn to protect, and he's being told this. It's like, what is, you know? Right, right. So, I like I said, I... I, I called him i called a couple uncles that i have and a couple guys that are in wrestling that 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 served our country and i just thanked them because like i said they did something that a lot of people couldn't do yeah. and because of that we're free yeah exactly you don't have to agree with red white blue republican democrat it doesn't matter these guys and women put their lives on the line so that we could be free right. and enjoy the ability to complain about our government. <laughs> right, right, exactly, right, right. Well, this one woman was arrested, and I want to thank our audience for sending this in. Uh, this one woman was arrested after a veteran's memorial statue in South Carolina was destroyed, and she actually peed on it. Oh, come on. Yeah. I, I hate to start off the show with this, but we're going to. A 50-year-old uh, woman is facing felony criminal charges after police in Southeast South Carolina say she vandalized a veteran's memorial statue. Uh, the damage took place last Thursday in the city of Bluffton, a town in Beaufort County along the state's coast in Brighton Beach. According to Bluffton Police Department Sergeant Bonifacio Perez, I love the name, by the way, Bonifacio. That's a great name. That yeah. is, yeah. Officers responded at 9.30 a.m. to Buckwalter Veterans Park after two people told officers they watched a person knock over the veteran's memorial statue and urinate on it. Come on. That's pathetic. Uh, the woman was booked into the Beaufort County Jail on charges of malicious injury to property and indecent exposure as of last Friday. Sheriff's Office online records showed she remained jailed. A motive in the crime was not immediately known by police, other than being a stupid ass. I guess that's a motive. Uh, the suspect was not forthcoming with information, Perez told USA Today on Friday. So, there you go. What an idiot. Yeah. Exactly. Again, it does, you don't have to like whatever candidates are out there. You don't have to like your politicians. You don't have to like what's going on in the government. But to disrespect people that put their lives on the line to make sure that we could complain. Because you think about this. You can't go to North Korea and complain about the government. That's right. You'll be killed. Yeah. Yeah. You can't go in the Middle East and complain about the government. That's You'll right. be killed. Yeah. But here in America, we can do that. That's do right. I like it? No. I wish everybody would get along. We could find a peaceful resolution. But, we, you know, we have the right not to. Yeah. Because of people that served our country to protect our freedom. 
Think about this just for a second. And I want people to think about it just, just for a quick second, then let it go and start, you know, keep on with the rest of your day. The serviceman who abandoned his post ran across the border into North Korea from South Korea, across the DMZ, yeah. and managed to live. And then was, was extradited back into the States. The reason he lived, wasn't killed, wasn't tortured, was because he was an American citizen. Yep. He managed to hold on to everything, even though he'll be court-martialed and he'll be tried. Uh, he's a member of the military. Doesn't matter what his beliefs are, but the fact that he survived, the fact that he wasn't tortured, killed, maimed, nothing happened to him was because he was an American citizen. Think about even, no matter what you think about your country, no matter what you think about political standings, like Bruiser said, the fact that nothing happened to him, that's the standing America still has in the world. Yep. Something to think about. Uh, let's move on, Bruiser. A burglar uses a grinder to open a safe at Taco Bell. <laughs> Uh, so, oh, okay, I guess, yeah, I don't know why you're robbing a Taco Bell, but go ahead. <laughs> uh, you know, there's a lot of quick cash, I guess, at Taco Bell, and sometimes when you got to get into a safe at Taco Bell, you need a, a way to do it. The grinder's not that fast, though. <laughs> Those discs don't last that long. <laughs> no, no, and... Uh, I really hope he got caught because he was changing the discs of the grinder. <laughs> I mean, let's find out. We're going to Memphis, Tennessee, where police in Memphis are looking for a masked man, at least he wore a mask, uh, who jumped through a Taco Bell drive through window, that's one way to do it, and used yeah. a metal grinder to break into a safe. I don't think this guy thought it through too much. <laughs> He's running around looking for an outlet. There's got to be an outlet. Come on, I need to charge this son of a bitch up. <laughs> You've worked in fast food restaurants before. Can you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's generally an outlet, what, about two to three feet away from most safes? Most safes are in the in the manager's in the office, office. by the computer, yeah. 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 So there's probably, you'd have to unplug the computer, you would think, in order to... Oh, yeah. You'd have to unplug something. Yeah. Uh, Memphis police haven't said how much cash the thief got from the safe under the front counter. Oh, under the safe is under the front counter at Taco Bell? There's some that... Uh, the one that I worked at had two safes. They had... Uh, one in the manager's office, and then the one in the front. The one in the front was like for daily drops. Okay. The one in the office was for something else. That will that okay. I wasn't management, so I don't know. Okay, uh, they didn't say how much cash the thief got from the safe under the front counter at Taco Bell on a state drive. That has to be for hourly drops, and then you take. I'm assuming, yeah, like so during many, lunch hours when you get to a certain part in the drawer, you drop it, yep. and at the end of the night, they move it over to the. But see, the office safe. See, the office safe has to be taken out nightly. So, yeah, I can't imagine there's much in that front safe. I can't imagine either. No. Uh -uh. Um. Maybe like maybe that's where. Oh, you know what? Maybe that's where they keep their drawers to start the day. I bet you it is. Yeah. So what? Two hundred bucks, three drawers at six hundred bucks. Maybe can't be more. Maybe than five, can't be more than five six. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. So. He's robbing that front safe at Taco Bell on a state drive and said he was able to cut holes into the safe and remove the money. So he did get the money in that front safe. This is the third Taco Bell targeted by criminals over the last month. And each time the thieves entered the fast food restaurant through the drive through window. Okay. They start, better start locking those drive through windows. <laughs> I guess, right? On October 24th, two men and a woman robbed the Taco Bell in the 2700 block of Perkins at gunpoint there in Memphis. According to Memphis Police Department, a woman driving a silver Infinity SUV placed an order at the drive through then went around to the window. As the employee opened the window, a man opened the backseat door with a gun in his hand, jumped through the drive through window, and took about $1,100 from the register. Police said the woman... So they were open. Yeah, yeah, they were open at the time they did this. Wow, that's yeah. gutsy having a, a restaurant full of people and relying on a grinder. Well, <laughs> I want to know. It. Well, here, well, let's continue yeah, with the let's story and figure going, out yeah. how he did this. Um, so he took about $1,100 from the register at that point. Police said the woman who drove the car was later arrested. 
On October 26, two men forced their way into the Taco Bell at the 5300 block of Knight Arnold through the drive through window. They demanded cash and then fled back through the window. <laughs> That's just an inconvenient way to leave. Just leave through the front door. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you really got to be kind of skinny to get through the drive through window. Yeah, you and I aren't going through a drive through no, window. <laughs> no, I'm not going through any drive through window anytime soon. No. no, you and I are not parkouring through a window to find a safe that <laughs> oh, we have to kneel at. Very to nice, grind. very nice verbiage, my friend. Par- oh yeah. How, what, how did you put that parkouring? Parkour, yeah. Wow. I've always, I've always, I, I've been intrigued by parkour, but I realized why. My favorite comic book character is Daredevil. He's really? got to be the originator of parkour. Parkouring, very nice. <laughs> parkouring. Wow. Parkouring. Yeah. I can't even half the time I've got to I've got to use some sort of leverage like a desk or something to get out of a chair. Man, I think of jumping and I slip a disc in my back. <laughs> <laughs> right? Parkour. No way I'm going through a drive through window. <laughs> okay, <laughs> cruiser, push. <laughs> I'm <almost there. laughs> I'll get there. I'm right and then I'll have you. to turn around to help you through. <laughs> <laughs> Right Give us you. an hour. We're going to rob you in an hour. Give us an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're both through. Can somebody give us some drinks? Yeah. Okay. Whew. You got a cruiser? Okay. We'll I'll, rob this place in a minute. <laughs> I'll take some of that Baja Blast if you've got it. That's delicious. <laughs> That's some good stuff. You, you want a quesadilla? Yeah, let's get a quesadilla. Oh, a quesadilla. <laughs> I could go for one of those. Don't give me any of that taco meat, though. I'll get the I'll get the Baja Blast in my jeans. <laughs> That's oh. how we get caught is they'd follow the diarrhea trail. That's right. They'd follow us to the bathroom. <laughs> and we followed the feces trail and found two very blown up fat men <laughs> sitting down, <laughs> shamelessly splitting a quesadilla. <laughs> Wiping their buttocks with dollar bills. Mm. <laughs> Let's move on, shall we? Another, yes. another restaurant robbery. Okay. Yeah. With another drive through window. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> These are young kids, you can tell. The This one at a McDonald's. A, a McDonald's customer trashes a restaurant from the drive through window because he was hungry. <laughs> it's not a way to go. Learn from Ken Patera. Right? Uh, I thought the exact same thing when I'm reading these drive through window stories. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, learn from him. Learn from Ken Patera. A man in Maryland ransacked a McDonald's from a drive through window all because he wanted some food. Wasn't uh, wasn't Mr. Saito with Ken Patera when that happened? Oh, yeah. 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 That's why that. Yeah. A man in Maryland ransacked a McDonald's from a drive through window all because he wanted some food. In a video recently shared on TikTok, the man can be seen standing outside his vehicle and yelling at the customers to get him food. As he got louder and McDonald's employees seemed frightened, the man began grabbing various items such as cups and ice cubes and throwing them at the workers. <laughs> He's like one, my food faster. He's like one big monkey. <laughs> Give it, me my food. It appeared the sir, man. You have to order. Mm-hmm. I ordered. Give me my food. No, sir. You have to. You have to actually order your food. <laughs> you can't just say food. Food. Hungry now in Big Ma. <laughs> it appeared the man was hungry and didn't like the service he was being provided. At one point, the man was so furious, he demanded the restaurant be shut down while also knocking over a metal storage rack with several devices used to print receipts. (laughs) He then demanded that one of the employees give him two bags of French fries, which they did, but that wasn't enough as he continued screaming at them. The man eventually closed the drive-thru window and walked off, according to... So he walked up? He didn't he didn't take his car? <laughs> like, what the hell? <laughs> According to TMZ, Baltimore County Police Department has yet to reveal if they have an open investigation on the incident. Just last month, a 59-year-old woman was charged after allegedly threatening to shoot up a McDonald's after ingesting fries with burnt ends. Hey, at some restaurants, that's barbecue. <laughs> that is. That is. That is. Mm-hmm. Police claim the w- woman ordered food at a Milwaukee location on August 30th, and she ate the majority of her food before approaching the counter with a complaint. Oh, you know what? They love that at restaurants. Oh, when you go and complain? What? No, when you eat the majority of your food, then come up. Oh, with yeah. Then you complain? Yeah. 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 They're like, oh, was that really that delicious that you 
Yeah. It had to stop. Here, I ate three fourths of this burger. I asked for no ketchup. Yeah. Yeah. She allegedly highlighted the burnt nature of her fries, followed by an attempt to retrieve a fresh assortment of her own. When she was informed that she could not do that, the woman allegedly accused an employee of selling drugs before proceeding to try and get new fries. <laughs> that always works. Come on, I know you sell drugs. Give me the fries. I'm going to tell everybody you sell drugs. <laughs> Shortly after, she allegedly told employees that she had a weapon and was going to shoot up the restaurants because that's the next obvious. Oh, yeah, that's the got. logical way to go. Yeah. Of Ask course. for a refund, threaten to shoot up the place. That's right. Um, this next one is a, is a, a bear after her own heart. Oh, okay. I like that. Yeah. Uh, again, I got to thank our listeners this week. They came through in spades. Thank you so much. Yeah. I, and there's, there's a lot of them to thank. There's Tony, there's Tom, there's the usual suspects. There's Margo. There's, there's a lot of them. I, there's a, we got a lot to, a lot of people to thank, Bruce. Good. I thank them all. Yeah. I, I thank all our listeners in general. They're yeah. amazing people. They are. A video caught a hungry black bear swiping a Florida family's $45 Uber Eats order off their porch. <laughs> There's a lot of bears swiping stuff this time of year. Well, well it's fall, and we're getting it's close fall, to so hibernation. They're, they're getting ready to hibernate, yeah. 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 So they're, they're grabbing what they can. A video shows a black bear stealing a family's Uber Eats order off their porch. The hungry bear took the food and then came back for the drinks because you got to wash it down with something, Bruiser. You do. Yeah. That bear's not stupid. No, not at all. He did leave a five-star review, though. Did he? Really? Yeah. The bear gave the Uber driver a five-star. Very nice. I, yeah, he's a, he's a good bear. It's hard to swipe with the paws, but you, you, <laughs> you get used to it. You know, it's you get a big enough screen. A hungry black bear gave a new meaning to takeaway food when it swiped a floor to the family's Uber Eats order from their porch. A video filmed by a Ring home security camera shows a courier dropping off a $45 Taco Bell order. Who orders 45 bucks for the Taco Bell? That's the whole left side of the menu. <laughs> it is. My God, talk about explosive diarrhea. Uh, uh, so the bear stole 45 bucks for the Taco Bell off the family's Orlando home. First of all, you live in Orlando and ordered 45 bucks. That probably, that's probably like two chalupas. Uh, if I was a in cop, Orlando. I would just scout that house because that's clearly a drug den. Yes. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's it, or, or an after party place for after bar. It's a, it's a meth cooking house. Is what it's it is. the only reason you're eating $45 worth of food from Taco Bell. That's right. Yeah. In the video, the black bear casually approaches the porch and grabs the right. bag in its mouth before lumbering away. Yeah. Uh, I, you know what? I, what do you do in that situation if your ring doorbell goes off? You know, it's Uber Eats. Okay, our Uber Eats is here. I'm about to go get it. You open the door and there's a bear. Uh, like, Give me my Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, you, good, good for you. <laughs> Enjoy. I at least make one attempt. So I open okay. the door and go, blah, 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 and then when the bear goes, and then drops the bag, I hope that he runs away, and then I go get my Taco Bell. But if he goes, I, and then tries to come at the door, I shut the door and run like hell. I'm going to let him take the food, but then I'm going to make sure he goes way off my property, because you know when he gets the shits from that, I do not want to poop it on my property. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's going to be like a mountain. Uh, the family, including Lady Gutierrez, Daniel Bula or Buela and uh, their niece Nicole Castro, they all come from different families. Came out to fetch their say. came out to fetch their food and look around in confusion when they saw it missing. Uh, they later checked their security cameras to discover their dinner's fate. He came and he grabbed the food. They said. Then he came again for the soda. <laughs> Castro told the outlet, "Well, it's because you left it out there." Yeah. If he came and got the food, go get your soda. How long? Who leaves their food out? Like, if I ever leave that door, as soon as they're out of my driveway, I'm picking up the food. You know, I don't even leave my food out there for, for the chipmunks to get. Neither do I. No. Because I, I, know, I know at least Spud will be curious, and he'll go up and he'll kind of snurf it a little bit. God love him. I mean, he's sleeping now. But, I mean, Spud will at least kind of take a look and kind of snurf around it. He won't eat it. Yeah. But he just, he wants to smell it to see if it's, it's like anything that I'd share with him. Right. Yeah. But I, I don't even leave it out there long enough for him to snurf it. Neither do we. Like yeah. as soon as that, like I said, as soon as that driver leaves, boom, 
eggs in the house. That's right. That's right. I mean, because we have hawks and tank and all that around here. Yeah. Plus, you're hungry. Yeah. I ordered the food for a reason. Yeah, you ordered it to eat it, not to yeah. not to feed the wildlife. Yeah, and I I never I maybe there's people that do this, but I I don't know if you do this. I never order DoorDash unless I'm at the place I'm getting a dash to. Like I'm not right. I, I don't leave a show and go. I'll be at the hotel in 15 minutes. I'm gonna order DoorDash now. I don't do that. I right. just wait till I get to the hotel. And then okay, here's the DoorDash. Well, not only that, but well, oh, and you heard about the new ridiculous thing with DoorDash, right? Unless you, I heard the the DoorDash the tipping thing right. where they we're, say we're talking yeah. about Uber Eats in the story, but but right. with with DoorDash, unless you tip the driver, you could get a cold meal. Exactly. Yep. And they warn you about it right in the app. I'm talking about the biggest bunch of bullshit ever. It's it, like it, pay your drivers more. I tip. I still tip. It, I'll tip. It shows up cold half the time, anyways. Exactly. I wait to tip. I don't tip beforehand because. I feel that makes them, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know. I tip them anyways, but the fact of the matter is, is, is it still shows up cold. Yeah. Or the wrong thing. Yeah. Or the wrong thing. Or yeah. You, you almost never get your full order. I don't you, know. think the, you think the bear came back for the sodas because <laughs> he was mad they ordered the wrong thing? Yes. He probably went through the bag and he was missing his gordita. I don't know. Do they still make gorditas at Taco Bell? I have no idea. I haven't been to a Taco Bell in years. I was there, oh God, it's been about a couple months. Yeah, it's been a while for me, too. Yeah, I don't know. I don't need a Taco Bell. Uh, Gutierrez told the local outlet that bears are so common in their neighborhood that they often check their security cameras before leaving the house. Well, then why wouldn't you get your food? <laughs> Uber Eats issued the refund for the stolen food. You're lucky, Gutierrez. Uh, there you go. That's the story there. <laughs> Jesus, what an idiot. Let's move on. A single mother was evicted and left to pay for damages after a standoff with no one inside her home. I know it sounds confusing, Bruiser, but uh, I'll get to the story here so it makes some sense. Yeah, I'm very confused. <laughs> that headline is super confusing. It is, yeah. We go to Stillwater, Oklahoma, where a Stillwater single mother of two is left homeless after the home she was living in was at the center of a standoff on Wednesday night that ended with a suspect not inside. So she shows up and there's like the whole Stillwater Police Department. She's like, hey, fellas. Yeah. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> what, you... What's going on? How you doing? Oh, we got, we got so-and-so inside the house. Do you? No, no, that, that's my house. <laughs> yep. No, I'm right here. I was pleading with him that they could have the that they could have the keys and that he wasn't in there, said Brittany Fent, who has lived at the home in Oak Ridge for three years. Now she says management has told her that she was evicted and left to pay for what damages occurred. Uh, so they broke down the door anyways, even though she had the keys. <laughs> yeah, she's like, here, here's the keys. Don't don't hurt anything. I have to pay a damage deposit. No, ma'am, uh, we're the police. We have to destroy everything. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't bring this battering ram to look at it, ma'am. <laughs> City will cover it. <laughs> Stillwater police said they had gotten word Wednesday afternoon from Lincoln County officials of Lewis Bearden III, boy, he sounds distinguished, being inside the home. Police said that he had a felony arrest warrant or warrants, plural, for burglary and robbery and that they had information that he would be there. He wasn't there, and I told them several times that he wasn't, said Fent. Oh, they're going to take your word on it, ma'am. Oh, yeah. You're a trustworthy person. Mm -hmm. They'll believe you. I kept begging them to use my keys and get inside if needed, but they didn't listen or believe me. Now I'm left without a home. <laughs> oh, no. Fent told KFOR, the four, that she had dated Bearden, but they had broken up over a month ago. I'm living paycheck to paycheck trying to afford food for my girl, said Fent. I got an eviction notice earlier today and management told me that I would be the one to have to pay for damages. Oh, that's that's horrible. Take it up with the city. That's what I would have said. That's right. Yeah. Because the city is responsible for any damage to police do. That's right. Get it from the city. In fact, if you go on the back of the police book they hand out, it gives you the price of stuff around the city. So if you're in a high speed chase and you hit a stop sign, it tells you how much that stop sign costs the city. Really? Yeah, so that way officers know. Huh, interesting. Uh, Fent has two little girls who live in the home and were with their grandparents when the standoff happened. Now they don't have their clothes and their beds are broken, said Fent. Boy, they went through the place. Wow, yeah. Jeez. 
They trashed the place, huh? Boy, I'll say the city owes her some money. The damage is extensive throughout the home and on the outside. Several windows were broken. The door had been ripped off. The children's beds had been broken into wooden pieces. Clothes were thrown around. Damage all over the walls. A TV was busted and more. Well, what did they think? He was hiding behind the TV? <laughs> like, I, I, don't, I don't get this. The, like, why are the windows broken? They don't need to break windows. I don't think this guy's a contortionist. No. No. Mm. And throwing clothes around? Like, what's he doing? Hiding in a pile of laundry? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think that laundry just spoke. No, no, we're good. Keep no, going. No, it was just me. I was throwing my voice and practicing for my act. I told them that they can willingly go inside and that they don't have to demolish it, said Fent. Oh, then you ruined their fun, man. Yeah, they're already all amped up, lady. Yep. Stillwater police are still searching for Bearden as of Thursday. Well, you might as well wreck the city. <laughs> And said that he could be dangerous. Not as dangerous as the cops. I was going to say, the cops are more dangerous at this point. Yeah. When asked why they decided to break the kids' beds, among the other things in the house, SPD replied, once we're inside, we're searching every possible location, trying to look through anything that could help find him. <laughs> what, and the beds didn't cooperate? <laughs> the beds are like, we're resisting. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we don't know anything. It's just us beds. <laughs> I just wish they would have believed me that he wasn't there, and I wish that they understood how the damage would leave us heartbroken. And I do, heartbroken. <laughs> you don't have a place. You're to homeless. Sleep. <laughs> and I don't even know how to tell my kids what happened. Said Fent. For now, Fent and her kids are staying with her sister-in-law until they can find a more permanent situation. I work just to live week by week and paycheck to paycheck. I don't have any money, so I don't know what happens next. Police Here's what happened next. The next guy you date, make sure he doesn't have a criminal record. <laughs> <laughs> There's that, sure, yeah. <laughs> Police ask if anyone knows Bearden's location, that they are asked not to approach him and call 911 immediately, especially if you want your shit busted up. <laughs> I was going to say, can I send him to my mortal enemy's house? <laughs> yes, please do, yeah. <laughs> If you have anybody who needs their shit busted up, call the I'm call the pretty cop. sure he's behind the Porsche. Look behind the Porsche. <laughs> <laughs> Got a really expensive curio cabinet I think he's behind. <laughs> Just throw that son of a bitch aside. He's there, I tell you. Yep. I think he's right there, officer. Go find him. He's in that nice leather couch. Mm -hmm. He's not a nice hundred. He's in it. Come on. Open it up. <laughs> Speaking of Cops Gone Rogue, I'd like to thank a couple of our listeners who sent this story in. Okay. I'll start it off by going... <laughs> Danger Zone! <laughs> That's what they jammed before that raid on that house. Yeah, they did. Yeah. So they told them, man, we can't take your keys. We're in the zone. That's right. We're in the danger zone. We're in the danger zone. We're in the need. The need for speed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling very Archer-like right now. Um, a cop pulled a gun on a fellow officer who threatened to spoil Top Gun Maverick. By the way, it's been out for a while. <laughs> a jury gave him 100 hours of community service and more for doing so. We go to Sydney, Australia. Bruiser. This is not a real story. Come on. It is. It's a real story. It's a okay. real It's a real story. Okay. Police in Sydney, or police officer in Sydney, Australia, has pleaded guilty to carrying a firearm with disregard for colleague safety after he threatened to shoot another police officer who said he would reveal spoilers from Tom Cruise's blockbuster sequel, Top Gun Maverick. It hasn't come out in Australia yet. They're still waiting. <laughs> I think it's out. I think it's out I'm everywhere. I'm pretty sure it's out. Yeah. I, I think it won you can, the Academy Award, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, you can stream it. Everywhere, worldwide. So the rules on spoilers are pretty much out the window, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you said what? It's it's a month before you're allowed to give spoilers. That's your rule usually, right? Yeah, about four weeks. Yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. Here we are, what, two years later? <laughs> yeah, yeah. According to court documents, 30-year-old cop Dominic Gaynor took out his gun. The only guy, by the way, who hasn't seen it in the world. <laughs> seen it twice <laughs> took out his gun and pointed it in the vicinity of fellow officer morgan royston 
who I think had to giggle at that point after Royston threatened to spoil the film. Royston had seen Top Gun Maverick the day prior. The second guy who hadn't, hadn't seen it. I was going to say, what are these guys in Australia doing? <laughs> Come on. These cops can't be that busy. I'm just saying. They can't be. The court documents reveal that Royston told Gaynor, I'll spoil it for you. <laughs> or, I'll spoil it for you. It's been out for two years, but I spoil it. Gaynor responded by telling Royston, don't spoil the movie or I'll shout you. He proceeded to, I know it's a terrible Australian accent. You're welcome. Uh, He proceeded to take his Glock out of his holster and held it stationary for five seconds while pointing it at Royston. (laughs) He's serious about this movie. Boy, is he ever. I think Tom Cruise ought to fly down there and thank him. I think so, too. Yeah. And then have him join Scientology. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Don't tell Scientology jokes on the show. They'll come get us. Oh, sorry. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Gaynor was allegedly laughing during the incident, and his finger was on the receiver and not the trigger. It doesn't matter. He's still pointing a gun at somebody. <laughs> yeah, right. His lawyer described the incident as a case where the skylarking and tomfoolery in an employment context had gone awry. That's how people accidentally get shot. Is <laughs> when there's tomfoolery with weapons. Right. The Australian Broadcasting Company reports that Royston revealed in court on November 9th that he fell into a depression following the incident. He said he's in jail and couldn't see Top Gun. <laughs> right. He said that while it was common for police officers to share jokes and tease each other, the incident was on a different level and left him with an overwhelmingly, or rather, an overwhelming shock and fear feeling. <laughs> Don't shoot me over Top Gun. (laughs) Shoot me over something more worthy, like, oh, I don't know. Uh, Showgirls. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Showgirls. The new Thanksgiving movie. (laughs) Which, by the way, I'm going to go see this week. Oh, okay. Well, that's coming out, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I'm on uh, the fence with it. What's that? You want me I'm to on s- the fence. Want me to spoil it for you? Are you going to shoot me? <laughs> but wait, I don't have a gun yet. Wait till I get a gun. <laughs> Pointed at you over Skype. <laughs> yes, please do. <laughs> shoot me before I go see it. <laughs> <laughs> he, said, he said that while it was common for police officers to share jokes and tease each other, this incident was on a different level and left him... With an overwhelming shock and fear feeling. I have completely lost the trust that I had in my admiration for the NSW police force. He said, while I see a police officer now, I feel compelled to watch them and check their hand is not on their firearm or on anything else for that matter. If you know what I mean? Stop talking movies at work. (laughs) Yeah, right. Yeah. Find a more common ground like, oh, I don't know. Criminals. (laughs) Jesus. Or don't watch such sensitive movies like Top Gun Maverick. <laughs> yeah. Maybe if you were watching The Notebook, you guys would get along. There you go. Yeah. Gaynor's lawyer said his client made an awful mistake and that a conviction would definitely see him removed from the police force, the lawyer added. This is going to cost him dearly. Gaynor was given a community correction order for two years, 100 hours of community service, and a recorded conviction. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Guns are not toys, man. Yeah. You, a police officer, should know that. <laughs> By the way, in case you were really, really worried about whether that spoiler got out or not, um, Top Gun Maverick has become a box office powerhouse with $1.4 billion <laughs> in worldwide ticket sales. <laughs> I think the secret was safe. It's the 11 high, 11th highest grossing movie in box office history. I think everyone's seen it by now. How did he not get... Do you hear any spoilers? I heard spoilers while it was coming. Before it even came out, I heard spoilers. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Let's move on. A woman accidentally locked in an OC jail lobby overnight. <laughs> yes, this happened. A sheriff's department is going to now change their protocols because of it. Well, yeah. <laughs> Prisoners are hanging out in the lobby. <laughs> I don't think this woman was a, pr- a prisoner. I think she was a visitor. <laughs> Let's go to Orange, California, where a woman was accidentally locked overnight at the Theo Lacey Jail Lobby. Whoops. 
they uh they, they did Bob, yeah. Did you uh, did you walk through? Is everybody gone? Yep. Place is clear. You checked the lobby twice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Lock it up. Uh this prompted Orange County Sheriff's Department officials to make changes in overnight checks of the facility and the installation of an emergency phone. <laughs> I can't imagine. I can't either. The woman came to the jail located at 501 The City Drive South. You heard that right. It's called The City, the City? Drive South. <laughs> Original. Okay. Just before visiting hours were ending at 5 p.m. on November 4th to visit one of the inmates who was unavailable at the time, according to Sheriff Spokesman Carrie Brown. While waiting, the woman nodded off in the lobby and was accidentally locked in overnight. <laughs> So she was in the lobby. It wasn't like she was in the restroom or anything. She was in the lobby. She was in the lobby. She was waiting. Yeah. Waiting to hey, see an hey, inmate. Bob, everything all clear? There's some lady sleeping it off, but you know what? She'll sleep through the night. Let's just leave her. Yeah. I'm, she's comfy. Sheriff staff arriving the next morning before 8 a.m. saw her and got her out, according to Braun. The woman, who was in her 30s, sustained a cut on her hand for which she was treated, but otherwise she was okay. How did she cut her hand? I don't know. Probably trying to, I don't know, beat her way out of the jail. <laughs> Cell phones are not allowed in the jail and there is no other type of public phone in the lobby. Okay. So she was truly trapped. She was in trapped, jail yeah. overnight. She was locked up. That is being re rectified right now. She said visitors will have access to an emergency phone in the public visiting area. Braun said, Oh, goody. Uh, there will also be a change in procedures to have a supervisor do a check of the lobby overnight. They don't do that already? <laughs> How come that wasn't on there already? <laughs> oh, we don't care if there's anybody in the lobby overnight. Oh, why? I mean, they're comfy. We take your word for it. You say you left, we believe you. That's right. Two stories left in Dumb Crime, Stupid Criminals. This is our not safe for work part of the program, Bruiser. So we, uh, we take a five-second pause so you can put in your earbuds. Or you can turn down the volume if you are, I don't know, around children. Why would you be listening to the show around children? I have no idea, but. Hey, children love us. I guess. Yeah, we're, this, <laughs> we're like Wu-Tang. We're for the children, right? Yes. Yeah, Wu-Tang's for the kids. So are Bruiser and Cruiser. I, I don't know. Uh, okay, so here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. If you remember a few weeks back, we had a story about an altar desecrator. Yes, about a woman who took a crap on an altar. <laughs> I remember that, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, this Ohioan is on the lam. Yes. Our, really? Our cereal crapper is cutting loose. The mad pooper is loose. Yes, the mad pooper is, uh, I don't have an alliteration for it. Um, an accused altar desecrator is being sought. An Ohioan has failed to show for the latest court hearing. That's been scheduled for the the mad pooper is is uh, I don't I, I'm trying to find alliteration here I don't have it Bruiser I don't have it today I don't know the mad uh, pooper it's a Bob's Burgers reference that's right uh, an Ohio judge has issued an arrest warrant for a woman accused of defecating on a church altar 27 year old Laura Miniard was due in court Monday for a hearing in connection with her indictment for allegedly relieving herself inside the chapel at Cincinnati's Good Samaritan Hospital. <laughs> Plenty of restrooms at the hospital, I can assure you. I was going to say, the hospital's got a lot of restrooms, and if you can't find a restroom, just ask for one of those bedpans or a bag. Oh, yeah, yeah, they'll give you something. Yeah. Like, they have plenty of stuff for you to go to the bathroom in. Sure. When Miniard failed to appear at her October 30th court date, Judge Janaya Trotter Bratton ordered her arrest. Originally busted for desecration, which is a felony, Miniard was subsequently indicted for criminal damaging or endangering, which is a misdemeanor. Since her arrest earlier this year, Miniard has repeatedly violated terms of her supervised release. In addition to removing an electronic monitoring device, she has traveled outside the state, failed to abide by an approved schedule, and did not keep a monitoring unit charged leading a probation officer to report that her whereabouts are unknown. Though her bond has been revoked twice, Miniard has been allowed to remain free on her own recognizance. Why? Because you just can't hold down a good pooper. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, why? She's clearly <laughs> breaking all the rules. Bring her in. You don't want her publicly shitting on things inside a courtroom. <laughs> <laughs> 
Do you think to draw her in, they're going to put an altar out with a Taco Bell bag on it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Miniard, who has pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, was busted in May after she allegedly defecated on the altar and used a fabric runner on the altar to wipe herself. Well, at least she's sanitary. Yes, at least she's clean. Yes. Cops charged that she also used a picture in chapel and smeared feces on table of altar. Because we must write like cavemen. <laughs> Miniard's address is listed in court records as a home in Loveland, a Cincinnati suburb owned by her mother, a registered nurse, who probably should have taught her not to crap in public. <laughs> yeah, probably yeah. taught her decent you know, manners. Yeah, and other things. Hygiene being one of them. Other records show her residing in an apartment about two miles from Good Samaritan. Miniard is currently licensed through Ohio's Casino Control Commission as a casino gaming employee. Don't pull that handle at the casino. <laughs> you don't know where it's Watch been. out when you're playing blackjack, because hit might mean a completely different thing you're getting hit with. Oh! And finally, Bruiser. Oh, God. Hmm. You know, it's going to be a good one. I'm a Target shopper. Okay. Well, yeah, you're in Minnesota. You shop in, at Target? They have Target where you're at? Mm, not as many as up in the Midwest. I shop more at Target when I was in Wisconsin than I do here. Tar Target's a big... Uh, it started in Minnesota. It's a big deal. Yeah. We love our Target. It's, yeah. a, it's a good good store. Yeah. I'm changing the way I shop now. <laughs> okay. Here's a headline. Target pervert gives cops bizarre explanation for public pleasure session. <laughs> what is it about guys who like to flog the dolphin in, in I have Target? I have no idea. I've never been so horny in Target that I just want to whip it out and start going to town on myself. Is it Even the, over the great deals they have, still not going to do it. <laughs> the great deals. Is it the red color everywhere? Uh, maybe it's the bullseye everywhere. It's a challenge. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> hit the target. Hit the target. Hit the target. <laughs> what is it? I don't. I don't know. I. Uh, I don't get the the flashing women. Your junk. I don't get dick pics. I don't get this. <laughs> like this. <sighs> this guy looks like a pumped up Urkel, doesn't he? Oh yeah. Yeah. I, he looks like a public masturbator. He does, doesn't he? He looks like he's just grabbing it and flogging it for everybody. Maybe it's the mannequins. Maybe they do something for him. Maybe. Uh -huh. Accused of pleasuring himself while walking around a Target store in Iowa, man. Oh, I figures it's Iowa. And he's walking, too. That's that's coordination if you're walking and able to do it. I can't walk and do it. No, God, no. I mean, that is coordination. Well, coordination or uh, it takes it takes focus. Yeah, unless he's doing step, step, stroke. Step, step, stroke. <laughs> you can be doing that. Step, step, stroke. <laughs> that's, it, like, that's, like, that's like that R&B song from the 90s. Watch me while I one, two, step. One, two, step. <laughs> um, an Iowa man told cops that he was not masturbating his actual penis bruiser, but rather a dildo he had in his shorts. So it was... <laughs> Which make, wait, that makes it better? It was practice. So it uh, was stroke, stroke, step practice. So he's getting it down so he doesn't hurt himself. That's right. Gotcha. Uh, it's much like the Iowa Hawkeye football team. We practice, then we take it out on the field and just beat you to death with it. <laughs> See? Yes. Yeah. Despite that convincing explanation, 25-year-old Deshaun Brown <laughs> was busted for indecent exposure, even though it was just his quote-unquote dildo. <laughs> That's a real life lifelike dildo there. Like, it's even attached to you. Like, how did you get that one? <laughs> I just get that flesh-colored dildo. What store did you pick that up at? You know. Brown, who lives a few blocks from the Target in downtown Iowa City, was caught on camera earlier this month touching his clothed genitalia as well as his exposed penis. Because why not? Do the over and under. <laughs> yeah. Hey, look. See this? I'm going to whip it out. Told you. Excuse me while I whip this out. <laughs> All I can stroke. think of now is step, step, stroke. Step, step, step stroke. Step, step, stroke. <laughs> Excuse me while I step, step, stroke. Step, step, stroke. <laughs> 
All I can think of now is Blazing Saddles. <laughs> the defendant investigators, the defendant, <laughs> I put the right emphasis on the right syllable, the defendant investigators stated has prior incidents of the same behavior. In July, Brown was sentenced to two years probation for indecent exposure and placed on Iowa's sex offender registry. He's not a stranger to this. And he's not a stranger to something else, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, he, need, he needs to talk to somebody while he wants to stroke off and target. <laughs> That's right. Well, evidently. Like, what is so arousing about target? Is it the deals? Huh? <laughs> is it the deals? Is Boy, that what's going on? He's going to go nuts on Black Friday. <laughs> 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 That's why he's practicing. That's right. You see, see, right now he's at step, step, stroke, step, step, stroke. For Black Friday, he's got to be step, step, stroke, stroke, step, step, stroke, stroke, step, step, because there's so many people there. <laughs> Do you think he's like a he's like a world class running back in Black Friday, and he's just hitting people in the back of the head? He's doing the Heisman Trophy, but instead of the football, it's his dick. <laughs> it's like, hey. <laughs> Excuse me, ma'am. Didn't mean to get any on you. So you're here for the, the Black Friday TV deals, aren't you? Oh, I'm here for more than that. <laughs> yeah. <sweetie. laughs> you want to watch something? I'll give you something to watch. Wait till those doors open and this fly comes undone. <laughs> <laughs> the doors aren't the only thing opening. <laughs> boy, oh boy. When questioned by police about his target stroll... <laughs> he gave him tips. No, I'm kidding. Just uh, the tip. Just the tip. <laughs> Brown reportedly claimed to actually have been engaged with a stashed sex toy. However, cops noted video evidence. That's right. They went to the video. <laughs> <laughs> that suggested the... Someone threw a challenge flag, so they went to the video. <laughs> That's right. They went to the video. Uh, video evidence suggests the phallic object in his hand was indeed connected to his person. Boy, I wonder what uh, which which official they went to to figure that one out. That's a line judge, totally. Is that a line judge? Okay, that's a line judge. Yeah. Charged with uh, several misdemeanor indecent exposure counts, Brown was released from custody last night after posting three thousand dollars bond. That's all it is in Iowa. They're used to worse things than that. <laughs> they have animal crimes to deal with. Uh, he is also facing a probation violation count related to his sentencing earlier this year. So there you go. Congratulations to Deshaun Brown. <laughs> he is truly a hands-on criminal. <laughs> the man who hit the target. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> That'll do it for Dumb Crime, Stupid Criminals for today. Bruiser, where are you going to be? Got That's a wedding. Right. That's Going right. To, uh, wedding. The, the joining of Delirious and Mandy Leon. I'm very excited. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Congratulations to you kids. Uh, very, very happy for the two of you. I am too. Yeah. I'm very excited. Yeah, very excited. I'll be up in St. Cloud this weekend, knsiradio.com, if you want to listen between 7 and 9 a.m. And uh, you can hear me do something other than this. Uh, sports, weather, uh, I don't know, monkey business, whatever uh, whatever floats your boat, uh, I'll be doing it that this weekend. I want to remind you guys to pick up uh, the new book by Michael Libling. Uh, it's boy, is it good, Bruiser? The, the book we were talking about today, it's just so out there as far as it, it is fiction, by the way, folks. The, the, the book that we talked about today, which is The Serial Killer's Son Takes a Wife. Okay, Bruiser, I'll tell you, when it comes to fiction and in disturbing fiction at that, this book has turns and twists that are absolutely going to astound you. You're going to love this book. This, okay. This book, I can't wait. This book is very unusual. And you heard the interview. Um, basically, Bobby Blessing in the book is the son of a serial killer who has to clear his name. And it's, it's this, uh, you know, he moves back to the town uh, that his father had killed it. It's a very weird book, but a very uh. good book. And it actually, Bruiser, what I'm going to do is I'm going to forward you the copy of this book so you have something to read. Okay, yeah. Not like you don't have time. To, you don't have time to blow, obviously. But this book is so intriguing and so 
bizarre, but it is such a good book. There's, there's, there's a lot of fiction out there these days, uh, a lot of crime fiction, but this one is so out there. But it's so good. It's it's just it's such a good book. Um, but uh, Michael's done an incredible job with this book. I encourage you guys to go out and get it. There's a link in the description of this program. Again, folks, check it out. The serial killer's son takes a wife. Okay, it's good stuff. Uh, but go get that book that uh, Michael Liblin has out there. Um, good stuff. That'll do it for today. Tomorrow, supernatural news. Thursday, we have Jeff Belanger. We'll be talking about Krampus. Oh, nice. It's that season. Tis the season. Yeah, it's coming up. It's coming up quick, right after uh, Thanksgiving. So, boy, things are going quick. I can't wait to, uh, like I said a couple weeks ago, my my, uh, my buddy used to scare my kids all the time with Krampus. And now he's got a two-year-old son who's just about that age where I'm going to I'm gonna share some Krampus stories. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Get back at him. There you go. So it's all coming up this uh, this week here on The Big Show. Thanks so much for joining us today for True Crime Tuesday. For Beer City Bruiser, I'm Tim Dennis. We'll see you tomorrow for Supernatural News on Darkness Radio.